I want to present to you today, thank you so much, um, a topic called Look On Us, and I pray that it will be as challenging for you guys as it was for me. Honestly, um, those that are closer to me know that preparing, preparing for this was the very hardest thing I've had to prepare for. Um, I know it sounded at the beginning like I don't have a life, and now it sounds like I don't try hard for anything, but it was very, very difficult. And I'm going to start by directing you in, in your Bibles, if you have one, to the book of Genesis, which is the very first book in the Bible, chapter 1, verse 27. And it simply says this, it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So we were created in whose image, according to the Bible? God's image, okay, we're together. When, when, when God created Adam and Eve, he placed them in a place called where? Eden. And in the Garden of Eden, we're told that that was their school. Listen to this taken from the book of education. It says, the system of education instituted at the beginning of the world was to be a model for man throughout all after time. Throughout all after time. As an illustration of its principles, a model school was established in Eden, the home of our first parents. The Garden of Eden was the schoolroom. Nature was the lesson book. And the creator himself was the instructor. And the parents of the human family were students. Now we all know what happens after their place in Eden. They enjoy their marriage for, for a period of time that's not told to us. But in Genesis 3, what happens? Temptation and sin, right? And after sin comes in, everything starts to change. So the world as God created it, man and woman in his image were created perfectly. The world at that time was perfect. But when sin came in, when they, were, when they were tempted and they sinned, things started to change. Their nature started to change. They no longer wanted to do good. Instead, it was easier for them to do evil. The lovely rose that you see would start to grow thorns. The bushes would start, would start to grow weeds. Up. The whole face of the planet began to start changing because of sin. And now we were no longer in the image of God. How do we know that? In Genesis 5, it says this. It says that Adam lived 130 years, verse 3, if you have your Bible. He fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. So from after Adam, man was no longer created in the image of God. Instead, it was the image of his own fallen self. Are we together? So my question then, if you heard the scripture reading, it said that Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, look on us. Peter and John met a poor man and said to him, look at us. But how could he have seen anything if they had fallen angels? How could he have seen anything if they no longer resembled God? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we simply ask that you speak to us today. Speak to our minds, speak to our hearts. Father, if I'm honest, I know that I've sinned against you and against all of heaven. I know I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But Father, in the same way, I know that your son will forever be worthy to be called my Savior. And so we ask you to speak to us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Does anyone know what the word covenant means? Contract, okay? I mean, I'm looking for one more. Agreement. So we've got contract and we've got agreement, sometimes verbal, sometimes written, but it's usually some sort of agreement between two or more parties. The Bible also teaches us in regards to covenant about this relational concept between what's usually God and man. Now this relationship concept, this relational concept, also known as a covenantal concept, can be understood as the Bible gives us three different ways. Now the first way is through slave and master. That's the first way you can see a, a covenantal relationship between God and man. That's the first, first type of relationship you can see between God and man. Does that make sense? God being the master, the ruler, and man carrying out his deeds. But it gets a little bit personal, a bit more personal than that. Another one we can see is, is the, the parent-to-child relationship. Can you see there the aspect of God being the Father, we being His creation, right? And the third one is marriage. The Bible likens Christ to the bridegroom and His church to His what? His bride. His people being His bride, 
the bridegroom now being ready to receive his people, but his people preparing to see him. Three different types of covenantal relationships. What's the difference then, do you think, between a human, a human to human covenantal relationship to a human to God? The difference is this. If you have two human parties, that are, that are contractually agreed to one another, then what you will find is that both parties are looking to gain as much as possible whilst losing as little as possible. We see that in contracts. In, in every type of contract, the, the only way a contract is agreed upon is if one party is almost, or at least looking to be guaranteed that they're going to gain something in return. And the only reason someone else would sign that is if they're going to gain. Does that make sense? No? All right. How would then we compare that to a relationship with God and with man? This would be the difference. God isn't looking to just gain as much as possible whilst losing as least as possible. How do we know that? One, because God has given us everything that he had to give. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So everything that God had to give us, he gave us. Everything. A covenantal relationship between man and between God simply suggests this, that God gives you 100% of him. God gives you 100% of him in return, but not dependent upon you giving 100% in return. Does that make sense? God gives you everything, asking that you give everything, but if you don't, he's giving you everything anyways. He asks that you give everything, but his giving is not dependent upon yours. That's the difference between a human and a godly covenant. It's a relationship based on love, trust, and wholehearted commitment. Now, sometimes, most of the times, when we think of the word covenant, what, what naturally pops into our mind is law, stipulation, all these legalities, God's covenant was never intended to be seen like that, the same way God's law was never intended to be seen like that. But often we see that, you know, the covenant or the law of God, it, it comes with punishments or rewards. And that's right, that's not wrong. But it was, never, it was never meant to be seen in that light. Naturally, when you engage in a relationship with someone, there are punishments or rewards dependent upon how you've behaved in that relationship. Does that make sense? You kill someone in that relationship, you're going to suffer the consequences. Very simple premise. But what I want you to do is I want you to think of creation in reverse. Hands up who's ever done that before. Great. Creation in reverse. I want you to think about the seventh day, the Sabbath day. And then the sixth, when man was created, the fifth the fourth, keep going back to the third, the second, the very first day of creation. And then even before that, before light illuminated the darkness, keep going back, before heaven was even created, before the angels were created, before anything was created, if you keep going back, guess what you're going to find? God, in his fullness, in his absolute, you will find God in everything that he is, and you will find only God. Outside of time, not bound by the, by the laws of gravity, not, not bound by the laws of time, but simply God. The Bible says in 1 first, first John 5 verse 7, it says that there are three that bear witness in heaven. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. The three are one. Sometimes that's kind of hard to grasp, but, but just assume that it's right for now. These three are one. Can you imagine the Godhead? Before creation, just dwelling with one another. Just listening intently to one another. When one of them speaks, the other one listens as if he's never heard it before. Listening with such intense interest. Almost as if his life is hanging on the word of that speaker. Utmost respect. Utmost love. Relationship that God the Father would have with God the Son. And that God the Son would have with God the Holy Spirit. That God the Holy Spirit would have with the other two. A covenantal relationship based on one thing, and that is love. First John 4, 8, God is love. 
And therefore, every single covenant that he established with his people was based on that fact. God is love. So everything that you see in the Bible, whether it be the woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8, or whether it be God wiping out a nation, somewhere in there, God is love. And so he bases every covenant that he makes with man on the same rules that he would base it with himself. In other words, God would have it that we are treated every single time the way that he would wish to be treated if our roles were reversed. Let me say that again. God has treated you at every single moment in your life the same way he would want you to treat him had you been the creator and he been the created. So we have this, this everlasting covenant. But then we have these individual covenants that were made to people such as Abraham, Noah, David, Israel, Adam. These covenants that God made with humans, these were all individual covenants, but they all were just locally applied versions of the greater covenant, the greater relationship. Does that make sense? They weren't different in any way. They were, just, they were just applied to that time, applied to that people. Stay with me. Sometimes, in fact, most of the times, dare I say all the time, we think that this, this relationship is just for us. That God, that, that, that God gave us something, but, it, but it's just for us, that this relationship is, is just ours, you know, the believers, the saved ones, if we may. I'm here to suggest that we could not be more wrong. Somewhere down the line, someone deceived the majority of our people into thinking that the gospel was just for God's people. Somewhere down the line, we believed the lie that Christ only came to save us. How can I prove that? How many of us today, and just be honest, are, are, are actively involved in evangelism, in witnessing, in mission work? A few hands. And that's not to look down on someone else and say, why aren't you involved? But, but it's simply that when you're given something so great, when you find something so amazing, your natural response is not to keep it to yourself. You'll find that when you watch a great movie, You'll never watch the movie and think, wow, that was a great movie. I never want to tell anyone about that movie. Or you hear a great song. Like, wow, they really praise God in that song. I'll, just, I'll praise him by myself with that song. Natural instinct says when we find something that we really like, that emotionally connects with us, that we share it. The gospel, and this is what we're going to be looking at today, the love of God in its fullest was never ever intended to be exclusive. It was always intended to be inclusive. It was never intended to be hoarded. It was intended to be shared. And I know that it makes Christ sick. Literally, it makes Jesus sick. It tells us in Scripture. To see when a beggar accepts what we know today as eternal life, salvation, accepts him as their savior, and then gets cleaned up, gets suited up, gets, gets shaped up, and, and comes to church and just stays there, rather than going back to the valleys where all the other beggars are telling him where to get bread. That must make him sick. Listen to this, it says, ye are the light of the world. The Jews thought to confine the benefits of salvation to their own nation. But Christ showed them that salvation is like the sunshine. It belongs to the whole world. It says the religion of the Bible is not to be confined between the covers of a book, nor within the walls of a church. It is to be brought out occasionally for our own it is sorry, it is not to be brought out occasionally for our own benefit and then to be carefully laid aside again. It is to sanctify the daily life, to manifest itself in every business, 
transaction and in all our social relationships. When it says sanctify, it just means, it just means to make you holy. It's there to take you from one place and take you to another place. Now, 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 now listen to this. I want you to imagine God's covenant, this, this relationship. Imagine it as his estate. So, so you know when you have a will? Everyone know what a will is? You have your will, and, and the things that that will contains, that's called your estate. And so imagine this. Imagine that God has a will, and in this estate is contained, let's say, three things. The first one is eternal life, salvation. The second one then would be any, any tempor temporal blessings that you get from that also. And the third being responsibilities. So in the estate of God's will, you get salvation, you get blessings, and you get responsibilities. Often we would think that, you know, let's say God was to say, you know, I I'm, I'm sending my will out, to, out now. So, so here's, here's my will. We would think as people like Adam like Noah, like Abraham, David, Israel, they are the beneficiaries of, of the will. They're the ones that get the estate. Is, it, is that not a logical conclusion? That the same way God made a, a covenant with Adam, he made a covenant with Noah, with Abraham, so that then when his will is sent out, that those are the people that get the things that God has intended. But I want you to think of it like this. Think of it like this. Think of Adam, Noah, Abraham, David, Israel, think of them rather, as the, rather than the beneficiaries of the gospel, think of them as the executors of the gospel. Think of them as those that have been commissioned to go to the world because the world are the beneficiaries of the gospel. Who told us that we're the beneficiaries? Who told us that, that, that we're the ones that's meant to receive everything from Christ? There's benefits in accepting, don't get me wrong. But the benefits stop when you cease to share. Because it no longer becomes real to you. Let's look at some examples of a covenant. It says in Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and woman. And between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. In other words, a, a promise was given to Adam. And this promise simply said that, I know you've fallen into sin. I know that everything is going to change now. And I know that it looks like death is going to take over. But I'm going to promise you that someone's coming to save. Now, that's the benefit for Adam. That someone is coming to save him from the mess that he created. However, the missionary aspect of the covenantal relationship suggests that it can't stop there. That rather, Adam now has to pass that very same prophecy down and down and down through successive generations. That's the missionary aspect of that promise. That it couldn't be for Adam just to say, okay, I'm going to accept the gospel and then just keep it because no one else would have found out. Let me give you another example, Noah. It tells us in Genesis 6 verse 18. It says, but I will establish my covenant with you, speaking to Noah, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your son's wife with you. This was basically a renewal of the same covenant that God made with Adam. But he says that, look, he, that he tells him that there's a flood coming, and you've got 120 years to prepare. Now, how does that help Adam, um, Noah? In one sense, it lets him know that he has to prepare the ark. He has to prepare a, a, a boat, a ship, some kind of place where he can now be saved. And it tells him that his family can benefit also. So there's the benefits for him and for his family of the gospel. However, it tells him that now he has to go and tell the world. The missionary aspect of that promise says, yes, I'm giving you 120 years. It did not take that long to build a ship. 120 years. Why? Because it tells us that Noah went on to be a preacher of righteousness to those that didn't believe. The missionary aspect of the gospel says, yes, you can have the ark, but it's not just for you. But no one accepted. It was there for people to accept, but no one accepted. What about Abraham? Quite simply, it says that all nations will be blessed from your offspring. All nations. It doesn't say the Christian church. It doesn't say the Adventist church. It says the whole world is meant to benefit from your offspring. And then it tells us in Galatians that we are spiritually his offspring. So the whole world is meant to benefit from us. We'll touch on that a bit later. But I want to direct you to what Paul says in Acts 13. 
It says in verse 46 and 47, Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly saying, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. Who's he speaking to? The Jews. He's speaking to the Jews and he says, it was necessary for us to give you the gospel first. Why? Because you're God's people. It was just natural. He, 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 he qualifies the statement by saying this, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. In other words, he's saying, we've got this gospel, and, and God said it has to go to you first. He doesn't say it was never meant to go to the Gentiles. He just says that it was meant to go to you first, but because you rejected it, we're going to the Gentiles now. In other words, if you accepted it, you would be the one to go to the Gentiles. In other words, again, if you haven't accepted it, that's why you haven't gone. If you accepted the gospel, then you would be the light to the world. If you didn't accept it, then you wouldn't be the light, and therefore we would have to be the light. That's what Paul is saying. And then he quotes the book of Isaiah. He says, For the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Now, where's that, that passage? If you go to Isaiah 49, turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 49. Isaiah 49, it says in verse 3, and he said to me, you are my servant Israel. So who's he speaking to? Who's he speaking to? Israel. You are my servant Israel in whom I will be glorified, he says. Go, go to verse 6 and watch this. He says it is too small a thing. Isaiah 49 verse 6, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will therefore make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. He says very specifically, he says it is a small thing for you to go and recover the house of Jacob and the people of Israel. It is a small thing. In other words, he's saying it's a very light thing. It is, it's almost not good enough. It's a small thing for you to take what you have been given and to go and give it to people that already have it. It's a small thing, he says, to, tr to try and save the saved. It's a, it's a small thing to try and clean those that have already been washed. It's a small thing to feed those that are full up. It's a small thing, but we seem to have got in the habit of just doing small things. He said it's a small thing to take the gospel and to give it to those that have it. But rather, I'm going to send you as a light to the world. In other words, if I'm sending you as a light to somewhere, that means that that place doesn't have a light. It means that place is in darkness. It's the one place that needs a light. Think about this. If you're in the brightest room in the world and you bring a torch and you turn it on, what are you going to see? Nothing. Why? Because it's already bright. It's much brighter than your individual torch. But if you take that one small half battery torch and take it to a place that's in complete darkness, can you imagine what's going to happen? The Bible says that light and darkness, they cannot dwell together. It's not even comprehensible. But don't miss this. There's a Chinese proverb that says this, that the darkest place in the room is underneath the light source. Yeah, you missed it. If, if you had one candle in the room and it lit up the whole room, the darkest place in that room is going to be right underneath the candle. In other words, you can be close to the source, but if you're not standing where it's shining, you're in darkness. You can be close, don't get me wrong. You can be close to Christ, close, physically close, in his house with his people. You can be close. But if you're not allowing the very rays of that gospel to shine on your life, you are in as much darkness as those that never heard of it. It's a small thing, he says. 
And so God at one point decides to establish his people. He establishes people in Eden, but things start to happen. They ended up in captives in Egypt. And God says, I'm going to rescue my people. And so what he does is he sends his servant into Egypt. And he, he lets the Pharaoh know that he's taking his people. Now, we're not going to go into everything that happened. All I know is that God wins. And then he takes his people out of Egypt. And when he takes them out of Egypt, he takes them through the Red Sea. He opens water for them and guides them through. And when they get to the other side, he decides to, to give them food, rain down from heaven and not only does he do that but when they get thirsty he takes a rock the driest thing known to man and takes water from it now not only does he do that but he gets them to build a temple where they can go and actually be with the presence of God he's doing all these things to establish a people to to prepare the Israelites to be a great nation not so that they could live happily ever after the purpose of taking the Israelites out of Egypt was not to separate them from Egypt forever, but rather to take them out, to change them to who they're meant to be, so that Egypt now see who they had compared to who is there now, and then Egypt would come to them rather than them go back. The purpose of God saving the Israelites from Egypt was not so that they could live happily ever after but rather it's so that they could be a blessing to every nation that's around them. God did not call the Adventist church just to be a church, but rather so that they could be a blessing to every church around them and to every unchurched person around them. But then it says this, one of the saddest verses you'll ever read, Ezekiel 36 is where the main body of the message is. Ezekiel 36. If you have your Bibles, go to verse 17. Starting from verse 16 in Ezekiel 36, that's just before the book of Daniel. It says this, Ezekiel 36 verse 16, it says, Then this further message came to me from the Lord. Son of man, when the people of Israel, speaking to, speaking to Ezekiel, he says, when the people of Israel were living in their own land, in other words, when I saved them and gave them a place to dwell, when they were living in their own land, they defiled it by the evil ways that they lived. Now listen to how he describes their actions. Listen, ladies, you're going to understand this. He says, to me, their conduct was as unclean as a woman's menstrual cloth. Yes. Like that. When I first read that, 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 I probably sounded just like that. He describes their behavior to a cloth that ladies use when it's their time of the month. In other words, it was filthy. In other words, it was blood stained. In other, did you guys know that back in, back in the olden times when, when it was that time of the month for women, they weren't allowed to go in the sanctuary? They, they, they were told you can't go in, you're, you're, you're unclean. So that the same punishment for touching um, pork, for committing adultery, was, was, which, you know, actually, were actually they were stoned. But <laughs> the point was, you were unclean. And it was a natural thing. You had, last time, well, I'm not an expert in these things, but as far as I know, you don't really have control, right? It, it just comes and goes. So, so, so you're almost being punished just because that's who you are. But, but God says, the behavior of my people reminds me of when women are on their period. I could say that a hundred times and I'd still be like, whoa. He goes on to say, they polluted the land with murder and the worship of idols. So I poured out my fury on them. I scattered them to many lands to punish them for the way that they had behaved. But when they were scattered among the nations, now this is where it gets worse. When they were scattered amongst the nations, they brought shame on my holy name. For the nations said, these are the people of the Lord. But he couldn't keep them safe in his own land. Then I was concerned for my holy name, God said, on which my people brought shame among the nations. He says, therefore, give the people of Israel this message from the sovereign Lord. I am bringing you back, but not because you deserve it. I am bringing you back 
and I'm doing it to protect my holy name on which you brought shame while you were scattered among the nations. In other words, God would have loved for all of the believers to be in one place. In fact, he would have loved for all the believers to, to, to have the whole earth to themselves. But because we've sinned, because we've fallen short of the glory of God, he had to scatter us all across the world. So you find believers everywhere. And he said, that's not so much of a problem. The problem is that they told others they were believers but didn't really act like believers. And so whilst they said we're Christian, they didn't really show who God was. So they didn't really show that they were Christian, but they said that they were Christian. And God said, that brings more shame on my holy name. Because now they look at my people and they say, these, these are God's people? So, so, so the skeptics that don't even believe that God is real, you're his people. We're his people. And that's going to get them to believe, right? So he says, rather than that, rather than take you back because you've done anything well, I'm going to take you back because I need to save my own name. In other words, you've gone so far away from me that now I need to do this to save my own name, the only name by which people will be saved. And so he says this, I will show how holy my great name is, the name on which you brought shame among the nations. And when I reveal my holiness through you before their very eyes, says the sovereign Lord, then the nations will know that I am the Lord. Today's topic we're looking at is called the evidence. And it says right there that I'm going to take you back, not because you've done something, but because of who I am. And then when I show myself to be holy through your life, that's when the nations are going to know that I am God. In other words, that's when the skeptics will turn to believers. That's when the non-believers will turn to people that know how to praise in the right way. That's when people that hate God right now will stand boldly for him. When I show the world who I am through you, but I'm not doing it because of you. So the question then is this, judging on what we looked at at the beginning. How will God reveal his holiness through us if we are fallen sinful men and women? What's the link? Listen to this. Taken from the book Christian Education, it says the true object of education is to restore the image of God in the soul. Can I say that one more time? Because I heard what you guys said when you said that that's why you're going to university, and that's fine. But, but we're told that the true object of education is to restore the image of God in the soul. In other words, education understands that we no longer look like God. But its purpose is to restore God's image in our lives. What does that mean? The book of education Page 30 says this, in the highest sense, the work of education and the work of redemption are one. For in education, as in redemption, no other foundation can man lay that which is laid in Jesus Christ. So if we're saying that education and redemption are one, how can we see that from the Bible? It says this, in Colossians 2 verse 3 it says, and in Jesus in whom are hid all treasures of knowledge and wisdom. Where's all treasures of knowledge and wisdom? Okay, and then Acts 4.12 says this, Neither is there salvation among any other name but Jesus, for there is no name under the heaven given among men whereby we must be saved other than Jesus. So salvation, redemption comes from inside Jesus. And knowledge, wisdom, education comes from inside Jesus. You can't have one without the other. In other sense, true education will lead you to redemption. True redemption will lead you to true education. Does that make sense? So then the missionary purpose of the covenants is to allow the world to see God, to see the image of God in us. That's the missionary purpose of the covenant, to allow the world to see God in us. And the object of true education is to restore that image in us. Does it make sense now? We don't have the image of God anymore, but that's what the world needs to see. And then so thereby we are educated in the proper way and sense so that we now have that image again. I want to read you a few things. It says, our ideas of education, and you need to listen to this if you're a student. You need to. It says, our ideas of education take too narrow and too low a range. Come here for a career, for a job, for money, 
too narrow, too small. You're limiting yourself. Take too narrow a range. It says there is need of a broader scope, a higher aim. True education means more, listen, means more than a pursuer of a certain course of study. It means more than a preparation for the life that is now. It has to do with the whole being and with the whole period of existence possible to man. Let me ask you a question. How long is that? What's the whole period of existence that's possible to man? Eternity. In other words, your very education is meant to prepare you to dwell in eternity. Okay, let's read on. It says it is the harmonious development. Who sings in here? Hands up. Who sings in here? Hands up. Why is it always the second time? It says it is the harmonious development of the physical, the mental, and the spiritual powers of the being. Harmonious. What does that mean? It means they're happening at the same time. In other words, the right education will have you growing in knowledge, will have you growing in physical strength, and will have you growing in mental strength. Physical, mental, spiritual. That's, what, that's, that's the truest form of education. To grow mental, spiritual, and physical. Why? It says it prepares the student for the joy of service in this world and the higher joy of wider service in the world to come. In other words, the reason that you're even allowed to be educated today is to prepare you for the service that you are meant to be doing on earth. But not just that, also to prepare you for the higher joy of serving in heaven. So you're prepared to do service here, but then you're prepared to do a higher joy of wider service in heaven. We're then told that love is the basis of creation and of redemption, and it is also the basis of true education. Love. Everything that you learn must have the principle of love, the same principle of God, dwelling with God, dwelling with God in eternity, loving one another as much as they possibly could, listening to each other with the utmost respect. Education should be based on love. But more importantly, it says character building is the most important work ever entrusted to human beings. And never before was its diligent study so important as now. Your education will always, 100%, will always have a massive effect on your character. The person that you are taught to be is the person who you will be. There's no other way about it. And that's why I even struggle, and I don't mean to step on any toes, but if there's toes there and I'm walking forward, I'm going to step on them. Think of it like this. I don't understand how we can still be in the process of sending our young children to school and have them sit among minds that teach them that God is not real, that teach them that the Bible is, is, is a myth, that teach them all these different things where we grow up and then we think 20 years later, why is it that they're not here anymore? Why is it that they don't want to go to church? Why is it that they can't read their Bible, whether it's KJV or NIV? Because we've trained up our child to depart from the way. The Bible tells us in Psalms 127 that we are arrows in God's quiver. If you think about a bow and arrow, wherever you aim that arrow is exactly where it's going to hit. When you release the arrow, you can't change its course. You're going to hit the very thing that you're aiming for. Your children are going to hit the very things that you're aiming them at. So we have no right, if we're aiming them at secularism, to complain when they're secular. Your fault. Hold your hands up. Your fault. Blood on your hands. Think of what education you're giving, especially to your younger children. Especially to your younger children. God has given us blessings in children. And then we send them off 10 hours a day to be with people that we've never heard of before. Teaching them things that we have no idea about. And then they come home with all these silly theories about why they're here and what they're meant to do in life. And we're thinking, where did I go wrong? Speaking from personal experience. The work of true education is to assist the development of your character, leading you heavenward bound. If you have your Bibles, go to Genesis 4. Because if there's a true education, then there's what? A false one. Let me show you where the false education stems from. Genesis chapter 3. If you're reading from verse 4, this is what it says. The very first book of the Bible, the third chapter, the fourth verse. 
And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. For God does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, he did eat. The eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. The very first lie ever given to man was that you shall not surely die. Now why is that so important? Because God said you will. God said, if you eat from this one tree in the garden, this tree, there's nothing special about that tree. That there, there was no wisdom or knowledge in that tree. Let me explain that point. There was nothing about that tree that separated it from the other trees in the garden other than the fact that God said, don't. Have you ever been in a situation where there's nothing special about something that's around you, but simply because you've been told not to touch it, you just feel like... You, you just want to touch it. You're not getting nothing from the touch. But there's just this, this rebellious thing inside you that says, ah! What sense does that make? Logically, it makes no sense. Curiosity, possibly. But God says, if you eat of this tree, you shall surely die. Satan says, if you eat of this tree, you will not die. In other words, God is saying that your life is based on obedience. Satan is saying, you can have life through disobedience. Satan is saying that the commandments were there to hinder you. So by breaking them, you'll be unhindered. And that's, that's what we see in the world today. Everyone, the majority of the people in the world today, think and believe that it's through disobedience, through breaking certain laws, through, through taking massive steps up in the ladder, that they can make it somewhere in life. In other words, if they obey God, they'll be limited in life. You know, you, you can't do the things that you want to do if you obey God. And therefore, you need to kind of step outside the Christian box. But God is saying that your whole life is based on obedience. Satan says it's based it's offered, it's given on disobedience. In other words, he's saying, if you disobey God and you obey my voice, I can give you a bit more than God can. How do we know that? Because they had life. So if he's offering them something that they already have, he must be offering more of it. He says, if you disobey God, I can give you the life that you really want. I can give you the successful life. I can give you the, the, the lives of celebrity and, and fame and money and wealth. Through disobedience, your choice. She eats. It says, ye shall be as gods, demigods, gaining knowledge. Satan says there's knowledge to gain through disobedience of God. Satan says that through disobeying God's word, you can gain in knowledge. In other words, when you sit down and break apart the Bible, show us the 101 reasons why it doesn't make sense, then you're much smarter than me. All I've got is the wisdom of eternity. Forgive me for, for, for disagreeing with your 15 years of superficial knowledge. The Bible says all wisdom and treasures of knowledge are hid in Christ Jesus. All. But the world will always suggest that there's more to be gained outside of that. Verse 6. It says it was desired to make one wise. No, it wasn't. But through looking at it, through this, this, this rebellious streak that started to appear in Eve, she looked at it and said, if, if, if I do that, then maybe there is something to gain. God says, God says, you have no proof of what death is at this time. No one's died. You don't know what it means. But he's saying, it's not a good thing. But you're only going to, to believe me by faith. In other words, I've got no proof to show you what happens when someone dies. No one's died yet. You have to live by faith in my word. Do not eat. Satan says, yes, you can live by faith, but live by faith in my word. Live by, take the faith that I'm offering, fake faith, fake faith that says you can still do this and get away with it, fake faith that says that your sin doesn't need to be confessed, fake faith that says that God is just love and there's no moral requirements or you can just believe and be a good person. That's fake. Notice what they've done after they sinned. God's creation then starts to create for themselves and they create fig leaves to clothe themselves. They're no longer happy with all of earth. But they start to devise plans. Or can I say that they've been educated now in ways to look after themselves rather than having God look after them? Hence why God has to say 15 verses later, yeah, I'm going to take those leaves back here. I'm going to give you some animal skin. 
The chances are right now you're being educated to, to disobey the word of God, to, to look after yourself, to take care of your own house, your own upbringing. When the Bible says the complete opposite. There's a verse in Isaiah 4 verse 1. It says this. It says, and in that day, seven women shall take hold of one man, saying this. We will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name to take away our approach. In other words, you can imagine that these, these, these seven women, and they're going to this one man. Now, who do you think that one man could be? Anyone? Possibly Christ. Who knows? You've got seven women that go to this one man and said, hey, 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 hey. Allow us, allow us to eat our own bread and to wear our own clothes. But please, can we be called by your name so, so that nothing bad happens to us? In other words, what does bread stand for in the Bible? The word of God. What is, what, what's your apparel? What's your clothes stand for? Your, your, your righteousness, your, your character. In other words, they're saying, allow us to interpret the scriptures how we want. Allow us to, to open the Bible and to say it says this and say it doesn't say this. Allow us to live by our own bread. Allow us to live by our own bread. Allow us to wear our own clothes. Allow us to say what's righteous. Allow us to decide if we're a good person or not. But let us be called a Christian. Allow us to live the lives we want, God, but let us be called Christians so that we can escape the punishments. The best way I can illustrate this is through the story of the rich young ruler in Mark chapter 10. Coming to the end, Mark chapter 10. This is what it says. How many of you are familiar with the story of the rich young ruler? No one. It's in the Bible, trust me. I read it this morning. Mark chapter 10. Are you there? Mark chapter 10, just after Matthew, just before Luke. Mark chapter 10. It says this. It says, and, there, there came, and he was gone forth into the way, and there came one running and kneeled to him, saying, Good master, what shall I do that I may etern inherit eternal life? Isn't that a beautiful question? Hey, God, what do I have to do to go to your house? What do I have to do to go to heaven? C can you tell me what's required for me to be saved? Jesus says to him, why do you call me good? There is none good but one God. Now, many people would use that as a verse to say, well, that's saying Jesus is not God. But rather, Jesus is trying to direct his mind saying, stop calling me good master. Stop telling me, I'm more than a teacher. There's only one that's good and that's God. Do you know who I am? He misses the point and he says, so teacher, um, yeah, what do I do? And he says this. He says, you know the commandments. And Adventists love this verse. We know them. All ten. We know the commandments. And then he names out the commandments, the 6th, 7th, 8th, ninth, 10th. But then watch what happens after that. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. In other words, I am an Adventist, born in the church. I've been, I've been keeping Sabbath from when I was like that high. I know all the commandments. I've been doing it from when I was a kid. Christ says this, he says, you lack one thing. You lack one thing. Let me ask you a question. How many things are required for you to be saved? How many? Christ says that you must just call on the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. You just have to accept Jesus and you'll be saved. One thing is required for you to be saved. He says to the rich young ruler, oh, you've been keeping the commandments. Okay, well then you're only lacking one thing then. So there's only one thing that's required to get you through those pearly gates. And there's only one thing you're lacking. In other words, you're lacking everything. It may just be one thing you're lacking, but that one thing is everything. In other words, if you don't have that one thing, you have nothing. Keeping the law is nothing if you do not have that one thing. You, you can keep the Sabbath, you can honor mommy and daddy, you cannot steal, you cannot lie, you cannot covet, but you can keep the, the law to the very letter without Christ. Do you know that? It just doesn't mean nothing. Legalism is what it's called. Keeping the law will do nothing for your salvation if you do not have it embedded in that a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you lack one thing, there's only one thing that you should have, that's Christ, then you lack everything. How do we know that he actually lacked everything? Because afterwards, Christ says, go and give everything you have to the poor. He said, no. 
And if he had Christ, it's the very thing that he would do. How do we know that? Because just the one chapter later, Christ goes to Zacchaeus, a rich man, a ruler, all this wealth, and says, and says to him, let me come into your house. And Zacchaeus says, okay, but let me give everything to the poor. In other words, that's what happens when you truly accept Christ. And Christ didn't even have to tell him. And we often get, you know, disappointed when our women come in with skirts too short. And, you know, their hair's too short and they've got too much makeup. Christ didn't ask Zacchaeus to change. He just changed. He just changed. He just, he, he, he just seen who Christ was, accepted him, and started to change. He said, I'm going to give back everything that I've taken. And if I've stolen from someone, I'll give them four times more. But don't miss the point. The rich young ruler came running to Christ because he's seen in him something that he didn't have himself. And when that was highlighted to him, he still left without it. There's something, there's a gap in your life, every single one of you. A gap in your life right now that can only be filled by God. Only. Should I tell you why? Who wants to know why? Because God put it there. God put that very gap in your heart because only he can fill it. And you've probably spent your whole life trying to fill it with money, trying to fill it with love, trying to fill it with pleasure, trying to fill it with education, a job, a big house. You're always trying to fill this gap, but nothing fits except God. So if you don't accept him, you'll always have a gap. There'll always be something that you're looking to fill. There'll always be something you're looking to take that next step into. Okay, that didn't work. He doesn't love me as much. What about this guy? There'll always be something else because only God can fill it. It makes no sense to say no to Jesus. doesn't matter who you are. Shall I tell you why it makes no sense? How many of you have ever heard of Blaise Pascal? Hands up, philosopher, Blaise Pascal. A few of you, okay. Blaise Pascal, he, he's got this thing called Pascal's Wager, where he says this. He says, imagine if there's just a 50% chance that God is real. Just a 50% chance. So he's given the skeptics, the unbelievers, the benefit of the doubt. Let's say I've got a good a chance of being right as you do about being wrong. He says, let's say you've got a 50% chance that God is real. That means you've got a 50% chance that God is what? Not real. And so if God is real, he says, then everything about him must be real. Does that make sense? But if he's not real, then everything about him must also not exist. Are you together? So he says then, if I believe in the 50% that God is real, then if he is real and everything about him is real, that means that salvation is real. That means that I can have it. And if I believe on that 50%, then guess what? If it's true, then I gain everything. Everything I've ever wanted, I gain it. And I lose nothing for it. But you, if you don't believe, and I'm right, if you don't believe, you gain nothing and you lose everything you have everything but he says this as well he says let's say you're right unbeliever let's say you're right let's say God isn't real then guess what you gain nothing anyways I don't gain nothing but I don't lose nothing you don't gain nothing either in other words only the fool would say no only the fool would say well I'll just stand on the 50% so that if God isn't real I don't gain nothing and if he is real I lose everything logically it makes no sense the logical decision, despite what the world says, is put your trust in God. God's ideal for man is this. God's ideal for his children is higher than the highest human thoughts can reach. The celebration from that should have been louder than when I said I was getting married. The, God's ideal for man is to take you higher than the highest human thoughts can even think of. Think of the highest. Think. And think higher than that. And then try and imagine something even better. Yeah, God's one was higher. <laughs> God wants to take you higher than the highest human thought. Satan wants to do that as well, though. See, sometimes we think, oh, Satan just wants to bring me down. Satan wants me to be a peasant with no job and no money and maybe, maybe not no wives, but maybe five wives, so I don't know what to do with any of them. He want, apparently, Satan wants to give me this rubbish life. But Satan will happily take you to the very top of the world if it means you get there without God. 
He knows your character. And if it means that taking you to fame would keep you away from God, then he'll give that to you on a free plate. So don't think that because you're going up in life, that that's because of God's blessing. Because God reigns his blessing on the just and the unjust. Those that deserve it and those that don't. But Satan will try and take you just as high. Illustrated perfectly in, ba- in, 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 in the Tower of Babel. He says, I can take you higher than God. I can, I can with, with the intelligence I give to you, you can build a tower that not even the flood which covered the whole world can reach. How about that? How about that for the most illogical piece of stupidity you'll ever hear in your life? I'll take you higher than God who's outside of the world. Satan wants to take you high as well, but just without God. I'm going to tell you something that you've probably never heard before. God is not content with just your salvation. God is not satisfied by only giving you salvation. Because the work of the gospel is to completely restore you from sin. Not just save you from it. Put it this way. Someone's drowning in water and, and, and they lose consciousness underwater. And, and you're the scuba diver. You go in and you get them. You pull them out. Now what do you have to do? One, the first thing you have to do to save them is pull them out of the water, right? But the second thing is you need to get the water out of them. Because you can take them out of the water, but if they're still drowning inside, they're going to die anyways. The first step of salvation is to save you from it. The second one is to clean you from it, from the inside out. How then, as we close, was the man saved just by looking? Just by looking at Peter and John. They looked at him and, they, they looked at him and said, hey, look at us. And he looked and he was healed. How? What we read in in, in Ezekiel says this. I'm going to show the world my holiness through you. Not because you deserve anything. In other words, Peter and John, I'm going to show that man who I am through you. But not because Peter and John were Peter and John. Not because there's any special about Peter and John but rather because there was something special about the person that had inhabited their life. Let me illustrate it like this. I'm the only Christian in my family. The only one. And my whole family know that now. I've been Christian for just over three years. The moment I do something even remotely not the best, not even wrong, they're on my case. Aren't you a Christian? Don't you believe in Jesus? Don't you keep the Sabbath on me like that? I know because of the person that I profess to believe in, I now have an image to uphold. Why? Because there's a chance that when they're sick, when they're down, that I might just be there and when they ask me what to do, I'll say, hey, why don't you just look at me? Not because there's anything special in me, not because I've done anything extraordinary, but rather because I am nothing. Rather because you knew who I was and now you see who I am. He says, I'm going to show the world who I am through you. Put it like this. The stars and the planets in the sky, in all their beauty and majesty, were never meant to be evidence. All right, the archaeological facts of the Bible, that God did not put them there to be the evidence. The fact that the sun is, is where it is and the earth goes around it, you know, to the exact particular degree, that is not the evidence either. Miracles, God healing people, bringing back people from the dead, that was not meant to be the evidence. You know what the evidence was meant to be? We are meant to be the evidence. The world is meant to look at us and see Christians, and that's meant to tell them, God must be real. They must look at us and they must see, not to us, look on us, but don't see us. You should be seeing Christ in us. Look at us. We are meant to be the evidence. You are meant to be the evidence to the people that don't believe. 
They should be, and that, does, that doesn't happen today. When the world is in trouble, they don't go and call the Christians. When the economic crisis came, they went to the people that were intelligent rather than the people that could have possessed all the knowledge of the world. When people are sick, they go to the doctors. They don't go to the Adventists. But the world, the surrounding nations should see who we are. They should see that we profess to believe in Christ, but that our works show our faith. We're told of a story where Moses is being spoken to by the Israelites, God's people, in a way that is not um, being received well by Moses. Let's say that. They're complaining. They're saying, have you brought us here to die? you know why they're complaining? Let me tell you why they're complaining. How long do I have? Do I have 15 minutes? Do I hear someone say 15 minutes? Thank you. Okay. So, so let's, say, let's just say this. They were, they were being brought on a passage after they'd been taken out of the Red Sea. So they, they passed through the Red Sea. They're on, they're on a particular journey to a particular place known as Canaan, but they mess up and God takes them on a side route. And when he takes them on a side route, he brings them back past the Red Sea again. Numbers 21. He brings them past the Red Sea and it says they became very discouraged by the way. Now I've only got one way to illustrate that. Let me put it like this. I was staying in Northwest London, and I was going to get a lift to work by one of my colleagues. Now, one of my colleagues comes, and she comes to pick me up, and, and she puts me in the car, and I'm in the car, and now, none of you know London, so that doesn't matter. How many of you know London? Whew. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And so, we're on the motorway, and we're driving down the motorway towards, um, towards Hangar Lane Roundabout. Anyone know Hangar Lane Roundabout? Suicide Roundabout. So, so you get to Hangar Lane Roundabout, and you can go first exit, second exit, third exit, fourth exit, fifth exit. And so we're driving on this one motorway that I could have probably walked in five minutes. It took us 25 minutes to drive to that silly roundabout. And when we got to that roundabout, the sat-nav, the wonderful, responsible, reliable sat-nav, says, take the third exit. Easy, right? What exit? Third, take the third exit. So we're driving up there. It's taking us 25 minutes to get to this roundabout. I look at it, there's like four different lanes on this roundabout. And then so we get there and the first exit comes up and look, I'm not even thinking about it because I know the first exit is not the right one. And so we go past the first exit. Great, 100% success rate so far. And then we go past the second one. And I'm thinking, well, hey, third exit. And then we go past it. And I was like, what? Carry on past the fourth exit, and then we take the fifth exit. Now the fifth exit takes us back the very way that we've come from. And not only does it take us back, but that road has got so much traffic on it that it takes us 45 minutes to get back to the beginning of the journey. I'm very upset at this point, very upset. But I'm praying in the car, God, you know, just give me patience, give me patience. And then so we, we take that, that turn, 45 minutes, we've been traveling, mathematicians work it out, and then we're going back up the road. It takes another half an hour to go back up that road to that, to that, to that roundabout. Attempt number two. We get there, first exit, pass it by, second exit, pass it by, third exit, pass it by, and then we take the fourth exit. And I'm like, Lord, how is this even happening? It, it says every time, third exit. And then it says, take this exit. And then you don't. And you take the fourth exit again, and then she, she does this. How many of you drive? How many of you are good drivers? Put your hand up higher. How many of you are good drivers? Okay. So, so imagine she does this. Imagine when she's driving, she makes a U-turn on the motorway. So, all right. Calm down now. She makes a U-turn on the motorway, and she decides to go the opposite way. And she comes out back to the roundabout. And she's like, oh, you know, we've, we're, we're, we're getting there. And then what she decides to do is to go back around the roundabout. And this first exit, nope. Second exit, nope. Third exit, nope. And then she takes the fourth one again. I'm not making this up, trust me. She takes the fourth exit. Now, when she takes the fourth exit, because of what I said to her last time, she doesn't try and take a U-turn again. But rather, she finds a side road that she decides to take. And then miraculously, guess where she comes out? She comes out on the very road of the third exit. Isn't that great? Only problem is we're going the wrong way. So we have to go back towards the roundabout, and we have to go the whole way around again, and then we come off. What I'm trying to say is that made me very discouraged by the way. I was very discouraged by that route in the same way the Israelites would have looked at the Red Sea saying, didn't we pass this 10 years ago? Why are you taking us back? But God wasn't taking them back to discourage them. Rather, he was taking them back to the very scene where their greatest victory took place. He wasn't meant to say you've made no progress. He was saying progress looks different to me. 
But after that, they say, look, we don't want this. We don't want to go this way. We don't, we don't want this God. We don't want this Moses. And so God says, okay, let me just take one step back. And as soon as God steps back, serpents. As soon as God withdraws his protection, serpents come and they start to, to, start to kill the Israelites. God didn't send them. But when he withdraws his protection, the craziest things will start to happen. Serpents, fiery serpents. The word fiery doesn't mean that they were on fire because they would have died. They were brass. They were bronze serpents. So you have these bronze serpents that are all around the place and they're biting everyone's legs. And it's such a poisonous bite that it kills them. And then they say to Moses, they say, Moses, we're sorry. Isn't that convenient? We're sorry, Moses. How about you tell God that we're sorry too? And so Moses says, okay, goes and tells God, hey, they said they're sorry. And God says, okay, this is what I want you to do. I'm not just going to stop the serpents from biting. What I want you to do, I want you to make one yourself. Make a brass serpent. And when you take this serpent, I want you to lift it on a pole. Now, logically speaking, let's say that this was the pole. If you put a serpent there, what's going to happen? It's going to slide right down, right? You guys are university students and you didn't know that? If you put the serpent on the pole, it's going to slide down, right? So naturally, now there needs to be something to uphold it. Does that make sense? Now, do you know what the pole was made from? Anyone know? Wood. Now, where do you get wood from? A tree. Yeah, you guys are much better than I thought. So you get wood from a tree. And with that wood, they made the pole, which they put the bronze serpent on. They put a serpent. God said, put a serpent on a tree. I'll say that one again. Wait, wait. God put a serpent on a tree. When, when, when they thought of the symbol that the serpent on the tree represents, what do you think came to mind? Sin, death, tears, pain, suffering. God says, take a serpent and put it on a tree. In other words, take the very symbol of death and put it up there and tell them to look and be saved. Why? Because the symbol means nothing. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say what looks like your greatest catastrophe, what looks like your greatest fear, what looks like your greatest downfall, God plans to use that very thing to make it your greatest victory. The very symbol of death he took. I said, if you look at that, you'll get life. Why? Because it's not about the symbol. It's about who's putting the power behind the symbol. Two classes of people. The class that choose not to look. They choose not to look. Do you know why? Not just because of stubbornness, but because they were so worried about the serpents that were biting their feet. In other words, you can be so caught up by the things that are going on down here that you forget what's going on up here. You can be so caught up in the trials and the problems and, and the tribulations and the sorrows from this world that you forget to cast your eyes above and see that there is someone where the Bible says that your help comes from above. But rather you stay worrying about the little ankle bites. And then there's the people that look. There's the people that look and by looking they're saved. Not because it was anything about the direction that their eyes were faced, but because it took belief, it took faith to look. There could have been a third group. Doesn't tell us about it, but there could have been a third group. A group that looked, but didn't believe. A group that looks at Christ. That when it says that, that, that he shall be lifted up and that all men will be drawn into him, they, they look, but they don't believe. They want their own bread, they want their own apparel, but they want to be called Christians. I'm here to tell you today that one, it's a very stupid, and I'll say that word, a very stupid decision to neglect God. A very stupid, like, like intellect, it's an intellectually void decision to say that you don't want God. But two, that if you accept him, it doesn't stop there. But rather the world, or how about even closer, your family, are now looking, not because they're trying to see something wrong, but because God actually wants them to look at you. Because through looking at you, they might just see him. They might. It's not guaranteed. People have looked at me and walked away. People have looked at you and walked away. But God says, if there's any evidence out there, allow it to be your life. Allow it to be the very way that you live. When Paul says, how beautiful are the feet of the gospel. 
the feet of those that preach the gospel. Not their mouths, their feet. Why? Because they walk the gospel. They live the gospel. They carry the gospel. My challenge for you today is even within your very educational systems is to show the evidence of God in your life. That doesn't mean you need to be perfect because there's pe- if anyone has seen Christ through a, through a man, then he has seen Christ through a fallen man because we're all fallen. It doesn't mean you need to be perfect. It means that when you fall, you know how to get back up. In other words, you have a pig and a cat. A pig and a cat, right? You can take that pig out of the mud, give him a shower, brush his teeth, put a tuxedo on him with a nice bow tie, put some cologne. Guess what? Still a pig. Still a pig. And when you leave him alone, guess where he's going? Back to the dirt. Why? He's a pig. That's what he was made for. He was made for the dirt. You were not made for the dirt. But Satan is telling you that you're made for the dirt. And that when you're finished this sermon, you need to go back to the dirt. That there's something in the dirt. Maybe there's some minerals in the dirt that you haven't got yet. But then you have the cat. The cat can step in the mud. No problem. Let me rephrase that. The cat can step in the mud. Problem. But the instinct of the cat is when he comes out of the mud, get clean. The one thing that separates the cat from the pig is that the cat knows it can get clean. That doesn't mean that the cat is never going to go back in the mud again. It only means that he knows where to get clean. That puts a whole new look on, on when the Bible says that you should be a new creature. Satan has claimed you as his pigs, as his swine, as his filth to cover the earth, to shame God's name. But God says, I'm going to do something through them that the whole world sees who they are. My appeal is simple. God, God is going. This is not a, you don't have a choice regardless of who you are. God is going to show himself through you, but in one of two ways. One way is if you allow him in your life and you allow the light that he has given you to shine. You allow the world, the dark world, to be illuminated by the very way that you live, speak, act, do. One way. That's the one way that God is going to be seen in your life to the world. The other way is if you reject him. And now instead of showing his mercy and love through your life, he has to show his judgment through your life. God will be seen through your life. Doesn't matter who you are. 100% fact. How you allow him to be seen will determine how many people come to him. That's what John says. He says, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And this is the condemnation that came into the world, that God sent light into the world, but men, rather than go to the light, stayed in the darkness. In other words, they thought that they were made for the darkness when God says, I've made you for the light. Just because someone's put you in the darkness doesn't mean you're not made for the light. You're made for the light. But he says, it's your choice. If you come to the light, you're saved. But if you don't come to the light, you condemn yourself. I'm going to ask very simply, if there's anyone here today that believes in some way, shape, or form that they're in some sort of darkness and they want to come to the light, I'm just going to ask that you stand to your feet. Don't look around. My second appeal is this. If there's someone here today that knows that they fulfill exactly what Ezekiel 36 was talking about. Where he said that I have put you amongst the people of the world, but rather you've shamed my name. The way that you've been living has showed them Satan instead of God, but has called it God. If there's someone here today that wants to make a confession, that they have not been living the life that Christ has asked them to live, not the perfect life, don't miss that point. 
but the life that God calls sanctification. The life where God says, I'm taking you from something filthy, and over a period of time, I am turning you into the person that I want you to be. He can change your heart instantly, but your character will take time. Some of us, myself included, I'll put my hand up, have been neglecting that. And so I'm going to ask very simply that if you're in the same position that I was in, that you just raise your hand. If you know that you have not been living the life that you should be living, or that at least God asks you to live, then I just want you to raise your hand. Today, some of you might have actually heard the voice of God speaking to your life for the very first time. Or maybe the first time in a long time. And so I want, I want to leave you with this thought. So if Satan sees that he is in danger of losing one soul, he will exert himself to the utmost to keep that one. And when the individual is aroused to danger and with distress and fervor looks to Jesus for his strength, Satan fears that he shall lose a captive and he calls a reinforcement of his angels to hedge in the poor soul and form a wall of darkness around him that heaven's light may not reach him. But if the one in danger perseveres and in helplessness and weakness casts himself upon the merits of the blood of Christ, Jesus listens to the earnest faithful prayer and sends a reinforcement of his angels which excel in strength to deliver him so satan cannot endure to have his powerful rival appealed to and he fears and he trembles before christ's strength and majesty at the sound of fervent prayer satan's whole host trembles and when angels all powerful clothed with the armory of heaven Come to help me and you, the fainting, pursued soul. Satan and his angels fall back. Well knowing that their battle is lost. When you leave this place, Satan will do everything he can to discourage you from everything that you've heard, from every decision that you may have made in your mind. But if you persevere and hold on to the words that God has spoken to you today, then he promises to send you the angels from heaven, clothed with armory from heaven. God would empty heaven for one. If he gave up his son for you, he'll give up everything else that he has. Hold on to that. And may the Lord bless you. Amen.